Okay, thank you. It's an honor to be here. I'm um, here are my disclosures. So I'm going to now talk about overcoming resistance to targeted therapy. Um, then Tony will follow me and, and discuss some of the same things with immunotherapy. I thought I would start by giving you a little bit of personal perspective on how I got interested in this problem. So I'm a medical oncologist, hematologist, also laboratory-based, and I, together with Brian Drucker and Moshi Talpaz, had the privilege of leading the first clinical trial of imatinib or Gleevec in chronic phase uh, in patients with chronic myeloid leukemia. Um, you know what a wonderful drug and poster child story that is for targeted therapy. But as far back as uh, 2001, we were beginning to see patients relapse. Um, and so here's a figure from a paper that we published now 17 years ago, which um, reported the first mechanism of relapse. And I want to take a minute to give you the context, because it's had a profound effect on me and how I think about acquired resistance. And I, as you'll see, it's, it's permeated beyond just uh, this one cancer. Um, so what's shown here um, is the crystal structure of imatinib, which at that time was called STI-571, bound to the ABLE kinase domain, and that blue threonine residue forms a hydrogen bond with the drug. Um, and what we found in the first set of patients who relapsed, just by sequencing across the kinase domain, was a, a large number of patients who had a, a single nucleotide change uh, within that region um, that led to um, an isoleucine in that position rather than a threonine. And at the time that we found this, yeah, actually the crystal structure had not yet been published, um, but I knew that John Curian, a crystallographer, um, had been working on it, and I called him and told him what we had found, um, and he sent me this picture. And what was profound is that it absolutely explains the resistance, because you see this clash between the cloud of STI-571 and the cloud of isoleucine, and this is now famously known as an example of what's called a gatekeeper mutation, which is present deep in the ATP binding pocket, and many of the first-generation kinase inhibitors form hydrogen bonds with these gatekeeper residues. The other important lesson from this was it was um, a clear demonstration that despite uh, patients who have advanced stages of this leukemia with a lot of other genomic alterations besides the ABLE translocation that generates the disease, it was still, this was the mechanism of relapse. It, it, it appeared that restoring the ABLE kinase activity was essential for the tumor to continue to grow. And then fast forward now to 2018, there's now four other drugs that are approved to treat chronic myeloid leukemia, um, all ABLE kinase inhibitors, all based on um, these sort of next generation molecules are based on insights that were gleaned from understanding the pattern of resistance mutations that appear with the first drug. And Gleevec is now uh, generic, um, and patients are living for quite some time. And there is finally now a drug that's in advanced uh, clinical testing that targets the gatekeeper through an allosteric mechanism um, that is very clever and I don't have time to go into. But now let's you know, move to a slide that broadens the relevance of this type of resistance mechanism um, uh, to other cancers. And here I'm going to use the example of lung cancer. So what I'm showing you on the left-hand side is a pie chart from an effort uh, done, uh, led at the uh, Massachusetts General Hospital um, by Jeff Engelman and colleagues, sequencing a large number of patients who have lung cancer but have the type that has a mutation in the EGF receptor and responds to first-generation EGFR inhibitors. And so the question now is at relapse, why are they relapsing? And what's clearly shown in blue, and a similar theme to what I was stressing with chronic myeloid leukemia, is that the, the mutations in the initial initiating oncogene are by far the most common mechanism <laughs> of acquired resistance. And the one that's the most common, the T790M, which accounts for over roughly half, is, an ex is another example of a gatekeeper mutation. And what I find incredibly gratifying is to see how, with that knowledge, the ecosystem of cancer researchers, both in the academic side as well as in the commercial side, has um, gone through a series of iterative cycles in trying to develop better and better inhibitors that can overcome the T790M. And shown in the upper right uh, is a drug called osimertinib, which is now, um, which, similar to what Kayvon showed you, can form a uh, a covalent bond with another uh, assisting residue in the ATP binding pocket and somewhat miraculously also inhibit the T790M 
and have selectivity for the mutant EGFR and not uh, cause the side effects that the first generation compounds had from inhibiting the wild type EGFR. So in a very short period of time after showing that proof of concept, that molecule has now become frontline therapy, um, reduced toxicity, um, so much more um, favorable for patients. But again, we're now seeing that by using a single drug at this stage, um, we still have problems of acquired resistance. In this case, it's mutations of the cysteine residue that are used to, um, for this drug to bind covalently to the kinase domain. We now get to welcome Dr. Poliak up to the stage. <laughs> I'll let, let you walk by Nellie, and you can, when you come up, you can tell us about the hours of, at Logan Airport. <laughs> Okay, so um, back to the story. Uh, but in the other pieces of the pie, you see that there are other mechanisms of resistance starting to emerge as we get better and better at inhibiting the primary driver. So what I'm now going to pivot to is a, a little story in prostate cancer, which I'll just take a minute to tell you. Um, but I've left that pie chart in the upper right from lung cancer to draw your attention to that orange slice, which is S. CLC stands for small cell lung cancer. So amazingly, and, and sort of the punchline of this original series that uh, was reported from the Mass General, is that patients who started with an adenocarcinoma and were treated with a drug that led to a response occasionally could relapse with a small cell cancer. And of course, the first explanation is the patient had a second malignancy. But by doing molecular analysis of that, of that small cell cancer, the, the, the mutation profile that was present in the original adenocarcinoma is still there. So that speaks to this concept which the field is now calling lineage plasticity. Um, and I illustrate on the left-hand side an example in which that can occur in prostate cancer that we and others have worked on recently where men who have an adenocarcinoma of the prostate that is metastasized and treated with hormone therapy can a certain percentage of the time, roughly 15 percent relapse with a non-adenocarcinoma that looks for all the world like the same as the small cell lung cancer. In this case, we have a bit of molecular insight into how that happens. It seems to happen most commonly in patients whose tumors have mutations in some famous tumor suppressor genes called P53 and RB, and it seems to occur by invoking some of the reprogramming factors that Dr. Yamanaka and colleagues described several years ago and won the Nobel Prize for. Uh, and, and reprogramming um, fibroblasts back all the way to embryonic stem cells. So I'll now close with where do we go from here? It seems patently obvious, I hope to many, many of us on the stage and, and all of you hopefully in the room, that we can't get away with single drug therapy. We need to leverage the insights that have come from infectious disease and come up with rational combinations. TB and HIV are fantastic precedents, but cancer is way more complex, there's way more diseases, but there are emerging examples. One is the combination of two kinase inhibitors, the RAF inhibitor that Kayvon mentioned, together with the next target downstream, MEK, shown on the right. That works well. Now in melanoma, much better than the single agents. And there's combinations of immunotherapy that uh, Tony will probably mention. Um, so why can't we move faster? The science is very compelling. Um, it sort of points to the right combinations, but very few people, uh, examples, other than the ones I've mentioned, have really made it. And I think a point for discussion is why is that? Um, one problem is there is toxicity when you combine drugs uh, together, but I would say as an oncologist who trained in, in the era of four or five drug chemotherapy combinations, we've managed toxicity in the past. Um, and m another point is we need to treat patients aggressively with combinations much earlier. So I'll stop there and pass it to Tony. Dr. Rivas. 